too. So do I. How about you? Yes, it's the new Swan Show with our great singing star, Doris Day. Well, I Swan. Our special guest, Bing Crosby. The four hits and the miss, the new Les Brown Band. We use one exclusively, how about you? Yes, how about you? Who, me? My name is Robert Hare of Gold, eyes of blue, and muscles like Errol Flynn Hope. <laughs> and now, Bob Hope's Swan's Eye View of the News. Berlin, Germany. The gap in Russian-American relations widened here this week when Germans living in the Soviet zone were forbidden to chew gum because it is too American. Berlin is now divided into three zones. Spearmint, juicy fruit, and stick it behind your ear, Fritz. Here comes the commissar. <laughs> After the law was passed against gum chewing, they arrested one German because his jaws were moving. The policeman said, you were either chewing gum talking or eating. The man said, I was only breathing. The policeman said, let me see your permit. <laughs> See, imagine if they abolished gum chewing here in America, we'd be in an awful fix. What would hold the theater seats together? <laughs> I owe a lot of wonderful memories to gum chewing. I used to chew it as a kid. My girlfriend used to chew it, too. In fact, when we kissed, sometimes it lasted three hours. <laughs> Washington, D.C. Dr. Northern, a nationally famous biochemist, has proved to the Department of Agriculture that the addition of minerals to the soil produces vegetables that are more than five times as rich in vitamin content. They've injected so much iron into the celery, lettuce, and radishes that now if you toss a salad and it misses the bowl, it can break your leg. <laughs> and the latest method is to drop the minerals on the soil from a plane. You have to aim carefully, though. One Pennsylvania farmer missed his field, and a mile away, John L. Lewis came running out of a mine shaft with a geranium popping out of each eyebrow. <laughs> That'd be better on television, wouldn't it? <laughs> All those vitamins in the soil are affecting the earthworms, too. I went fishing and put one on a hook, and the first thing I knew, the worm got a stranglehold on a trout, flipped him up in the bank, yelling, Hey, look at me, I'm gorgeous George. <laughs> New York, New York. Generals, politicians, entertainers, and secretaries all hit the literary jackpot as this week found their books topping the bestseller lists. Everybody's writing a book about their experiences except Artie Shaw. <laughs> He's still doing research. <laughs> and uh, Drew Pearson tried writing a mystery story, but it didn't work out. He couldn't control himself. In the first paragraph, he predicted who did it. I'm reading a book right now that's very interesting. It's about a traveler who's hiking around the United States, and when he comes to California, he thinks it's so beautiful that he sleeps that night under a rose bush. It's called The Case of the Quick Frozen Tourist. <laughs> Los Angeles, California, one of the largest crowds in football history, this Saturday jammed the Coliseum to see the University of Southern California score the major football upset of the year by holding Notre Dame to a 14-14 to tie. I've never seen such a crowd in the Coliseum. The stands filled at capacity, and some of the fans even more so. <laughs> there were 100,000 people at the game, including me. People were sitting so close together that when I got up, I was wearing a blanket, three fraternity pins, open-toed gold sandals, and a... <laughs> There's more, but if you don't want it, okay. <laughs> open-toed gold sandals and a raccoon coat with a student still in it. Oh, you're so impetuous. <laughs> Boy, that was really a rough game. I never saw two teams knock each other around like that. In one play, a Trojan ran 40 yards for a touchdown, but they called him back. The ball he was carrying had ears on it. <laughs> Polytech University. Professor Capstaff, noted psychiatrist, made the statement that his experiments have proven that inanimate objects can think. Hi. Inanimate objects can think? Well, that's right, Bob. So yesterday, I went to a psychiatrist, and you know what I did? I took a cake of swan soap with me. The first four rows better move back as he warms up. Small bubbles come out of his eyes. <laughs> well, sir, Bob, the psychiatrist put that cake of swan on his couch and asked what was troubling it. And that little cake of swan looked up at him and said, Well, nothing's troubling me. I'm happy. I'm happy because I'm the newer, better white floating soap. 
I'm wonderful in the bath. I don't leave you with a taut, soapy feeling because I rinse away so completely and leave your skin soft and smooth. I know. I use it on my hands, and they're getting so soft, my fingers look like five peeled bananas. (laughs) And then, Bob, the psychiatrist... The psychiatrist looked at the cake of swan and said, I think you have a split personality. And the cake of swan looked back and said, Well, I'm glad I have a split personality. You can use half of me in the kitchen and half in the bath. If you don't buy it this way, folks, he pokes it through your bathroom window on the end of a mop. (laughs) Well, Bob, I want everybody to know about swan because it's made by a modern, patented process that no other soap can use. That's why when you use it anywhere in the household, you'll agree that swan is better for bath, Better for dishes and hands, better for baby. Swan is the best soap afloat. Well, I swan. Me too. Yes, sir. Bye, Cracky. Shall I wrap it up? Here is the cover girl of modern television and radio magazine, Miss Doris Day with Les Brown and his band. Miss Day, please. Get used to the name of my darling. It's here to stay. Till a moment ago, we were Mr. and Miss, discussing the weather, avoiding each other's eyes. Till a moment ago, when we happened to kiss, and we kissed the Mr. and Miss goodbye. Now at last I can My darling My darling I've wanted to call you my darling For many and many My courage just melted away. Now all at once kissed me. And there's not a thing I'm saying enough to say. Except my darling, my darling. Get used to the name of my darling. It's him. Gee, that, that was great, Doris. Oh, thanks, Hyde, but I'm really surprised I was able to sing at all tonight. I'm so knocked out from Christmas shopping. Oh, yeah, I knew you were helping Bob with his shopping. Tell me, Doris, is Bob spending very much money this Christmas? Well, he said he was going to take it very easy because he lost a lot of money in the market. Oh, oh, did he have some of that amalgamated tin just before it went down? No, he got caught with 52 airmail stamps when they dropped to four cents. <laughs> well, that shopping tour, uh... That tour must have been some experience. Oh, you said it. I was waiting for him in front of Woolworth's. He was ten minutes late, and I was getting very impatient. Gee, I better get going or I'll be late, but this is so interesting. I just can't tear myself away. That girl is so beautiful, and she's looking right at me. She smiled at me, and now she's winking. Gee, she's beautiful. Look, bud, I don't mind you looking at the television, but keep your clammy nose off my window. I didn't have my nose against your window. You did, too. And look at those two spots you made with your eyeballs. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Now take your stool and your little bag of popcorn and go home. <laughs> All right, mister. Well, I'd better get going. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, boy. <laughs> well, thanks. And you'll type greetings to you, Jolly St. Nick. Who's Jolly? Here's California sunshine's freezing me to death. <laughs> I 
feet are killing me, and this morning my unemployment check bounced. <laughs> Gee, are things really that bad? Things are nauseating, boy. <laughs> They're horrible. Merry Christmas, everybody. Put some money in the pot, boy. <laughs> Well, wait a second, Santa. Who does this money go to? Well, it's for a very good cause. It's for the undernourished and downtrodden Eskimos of Upper Glendale. <laughs> now, wait. There aren't any Eskimos in Glendale. Can you prove it? No. Put some money in the pot, boy. <laughs> well, I've got to meet somebody right away or I'll be in trouble. He's got trouble. Boy, I am married to the most miserable, mean, and ornery woman that was ever allowed out of the snake pit. <laughs> She's really bad, huh? Revolting. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Boy, my wife's so homely, she's got a face like a plate of mashed potatoes with a lump still in it. <laughs> Put something in the pot, boy. Okay, here's some loose change. Thanks. You know, I only get 10% of what I take in. Last week, the organization made $20, and all I got was $150. Well, just a second. If you only get 10%, how come they got $20 and you made $150? Oh, I don't know. Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Oh, I'm sorry I kept you waiting, Doris, but here I am. Oh, that's all right, Bob, but you better give me your Christmas list so that we can get started now. I don't know which present to buy first. Well, you should always buy the first gift for the person you love the best. So, Doris, I've got everything. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Let's go in this department store right here. Huh? Okay. Oh, Bob, about the present you're going to buy for me. Oh, there's a I... friend of mine over there. Hello, Mort. <laughs> Bob, Bob, when you buy a gift for someone, don't you agree that you should buy them something they really want? Oh, naturally. Good. Well, I want either a real emerald and ruby bracelet and a full-length ermine coat trimmed with mink or a platinum diamond wristwatch studded with diamonds. Hello, Mark. <laughs> okay, let's look at your list now. The first name you have is Crosby, and right next to Crosby's name, you've written two dollars and a quarter. Is that what you're going to spend? That's plenty. Last year, I wanted a motorcycle to ride around Paramount Studios with, and I hinted at the Crosby. I must have told him 50 times that I wanted a motorcycle, and then came Christmas. What did he give you? An oil can and a road map. <laughs> well, look, Bob, I have a wonderful idea. You give me your money, because I know much more about shopping than you do, and I can save you an awful lot. Okay, here's my wallet. Oh, there's something that would be nice for Bing. A set of match golf clubs. Oh, wait a second. Oh, Clark. Clark, how much are those golf clubs? A hundred and ninety dollars. Hello, Mort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, I think they're wonderful. Doris, wait. And how much is that bag that goes with them? Yeah, that's two hundred dollars. It's just what we want. Doris, wait. We'll take the bags and the clubs. Let's see, that's three hundred and ninety dollars, right? Yeah. Okay. Here's $400, and, and keep the change. Mort, where are you? <laughs> well, uh, Bob, let's get going now, because we Wait a second, to... Doris. I want to ask this floor walker something. Pardon me, mister. Uh, yes, sir. Can I help you? Hey, look. It's High Everback. Yeah, get a load of him in a cutaway coat and striped trousers wearing a gardenia. All floor walkers wear gardenias. In their hair? <laughs> Hey, excuse me a second, Bob. Yes, madam, the big spectacle is on the fourth floor. Hi, why do you have to take a part-time job? Oh, excuse me, Bob. Yes, miss, the big spectacle is on the fourth floor, and don't forget, tell your friends about it. Oh, what's the big spectacle on the fourth floor? Well, haven't you heard about it, Bob? It's the most beautiful Christmas tree in town. It's 35 feet high, has 1,000 lights, and 1,500 ornaments. Are the ornaments pretty? Oh, Bob, they're beautiful. Each one is a sparkling, dazzling, shining, pure white cake of swan soap. <laughs> Hello, Mort. <laughs> yes, 
Yes, Bob, and how those women flock around the tree when they see all that swan, because they know that pure, gentle swan is better for dishes, because the faster, harder-working suds rinse away so completely, the dishes never need wiping. Now, you've got to see that tree, Bob. You'll never guess what the ornament is up on the top of it. Oh, yes, I will. Well, what, what is it? The Lever Brothers on a stick. <laughs> Well, really, the reason Swan is so popular is because it's made by a modern, patented process no other soap can use. A process that makes Swan as mild as the finest Castile. Swan's richer, gentle suds protect your hands and leave them soft and smooth. Now, just imagine any woman on Christmas morning. She wanted a mink jacket, but Santa has brought her something she likes just as well. A lovely cake of Swan. Now... Could a woman ask for anything more in her Christmas stocking? Well, it would be nice to find Charles Boyer in there blowing bubbles. <laughs> Millions of housewives agree that for dishes, hands, or the bath, Swan is the best soap afloat. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the man who boiled the hot water when Al Jolson was born, Mr. Bing Crosby, right there. <laughs> Little bird told me that you love me. That you love me. And I believe that you do. That little bird also told me I was fallen. You were fallen. Fallen for no one but you. There's no use denying. I might as well confess Of all the girls I know, dear I'm sure I love you best A little bird Told me we'll be happy Gonna be happy And we believe that it's true A pretty cottage, not too far, all fenced in like a movie star. Great Dane Pup, we're going to call him Ace, lying there by a fireplace. A goldfish pond and a wishing well. Everything is going to turn out swell. A little bird told us you'll be happy. And we believe that it's true. And now we know that it's true. It's true, it's bound to come true. Love that little love Thank you very much, and good night, everybody. <laughs> good night? Wait a minute, boy. Where are you going? I sang my number. I gave the show a little class. Now I'm off. <laughs> gave the show a little class? Look, you hopped up, Hildegard. <laughs> oh, you'd better stop going to that African barber. He's been shrinking your head again. <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere, Saggy. <laughs> Now, come, come. Where's this uh, new show of yours everybody's been talking about? Well, haven't you heard? I'm on for Swan this year. They make soap, you know. Yeah? It's too bad it's not something you use. <laughs> hey, Lump Lap, you've got two chins. Would you like to try for one? <laughs> now, let's, let's face it, Nostal King. Before I sang my song, this show was laying a large swan egg. True or false? Get him. Look, Philco Knob, last week... In a large set. <laughs> You're wearing the cabinet there, too. Look, last week... Last week, my hand slipped, and I happened to tune in your show. Now I know why it's transcribed, and you broadcast it later. What do you mean? Gives you time to get out of town and hide before the people hear it. <laughs> to think, when I first met this boy, he had a job blowing out glove compartments at a car wash. <laughs> 
steady, couch pouch. <laughs> now look, ratchet head, if I'm to... Insist... Oh! <laughs> Wait, late writing. Wait, wait. Oh, there's some sneaky things going on. If I'm going to endure this vilification, I want my money first. Shall I explain vilification before we go on? <laughs> He'll understand it around Gonzaga anyway. How about that? He's been on the show for three minutes and he's worried about the loot. Bing, what are you knocking yourself out for? After all, you know you can't take it with you. I know, so I'm sending my brother Everett on ahead to open up a charge account for me. <laughs> I'm ready. Bing, there's something that's always bothered me. When you send in your income tax, how do you get that mattress in the mailbox? <laughs> Easy, bog brain. I never have any trouble with my taxes. Why, I'd give President Truman the shirt off my back. I know. I saw pictures of him wearing it in Key West. <laughs> What's that you're wearing there? Tamale husk with a belt in the back? <laughs> it's nice of you to slip your coat on for this anyway. You think I'm too frisky? Say, uh, mm -hmm. don't care for that, huh? I guess not. <laughs> we'll ignore the next six lines. All right. <laughs> New kind of radio. Just throw the whole thing away. Hey, look. <laughs> you better stop being so frisky or I'll tell Abby Rents to stop souping up your wheelchair. <laughs> Wheelchair, come, come. That's no way to talk to a man who's just reached 35. You're 35? 35 mm -hmm. times what? Oh, wait a minute. You're snapping your wig, my boy. If you remember at my last birthday party, I had a cake with only 35 candles on it. Yeah, but at the bottom it said continued on the next cake. <laughs> but what does age matter? I saw your last picture and I thought you were great. That's a coincidence. So did I. <laughs> Read that line again. There's a talent scout here tonight from the Wilson Ham Company. <laughs> Any stamp will make you grade A, I'm sure. <laughs> like the stag one, a pink one. You know, we ought to make a picture together again, Bing. I stopped over at your house last night to talk to you about it, but nobody was home. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, I must have rung your bell about five times. Six times. <laughs> oh, so it was you up in the window with the hot oil, huh? <laughs> Look, Vigor, old boy, you're just jealous because I made the pale face without you. Me jealous of Bob Hope? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have so much more than Ho's nose. Why should I fight it? <laughs> Tell me, Bob, I want to laugh without even reading it. I love that. <laughs> How'd you feel having Jane Russell opposite you instead of me in that picture? How would anyone feel switching to filet mignon after a diet of hog's livers? <laughs> Hold it, swivel snout. Hold it. But really, Bing, we always have so much fun making pictures together. People seem to like them. They do well at the box office. How come we haven't worked together lately? Oh, I don't know. Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how to break this to you, kid, but on the screen, you sort of cramp my style. What do you mean? Well, for my money, you don't look too good. With your money, nobody has to look too good. <laughs> Excuse me, Bing, I didn't mean to raise my voice. That's all right. You're sure I didn't blow your hearing aid? <laughs> I'm tuned in to We the People. <clears throat> I'm on a two-party line. Besides, kid, I like to do a lot of singing in my pictures, and with you around, it's just... Singing? So... Mm -hmm. I didn't want to say anything, but when you sang your song before, you sounded like Jessica with her net dragging. <laughs> Why don't you give up? Give up? Singing is my life, Robert. It is, huh? Of course, I've been lucky. There's the radio and the records and the jukeboxes, but I dare say I'd have been a singer 200 years ago. Weren't you? <laughs> I ignore that and repeat, Bob, that 200 years ago I still could have made a living with my pipes. Are you kidding? I suppose composers like Mozart and Beethoven would have been writing songs for you. Not wholly impossible. I can see myself asking Ludwig von Beethoven to knock out a little ditty for me. Almost sounds as if we're going into a sketch. Could be. <laughs> Ludwig! Ludwig von Beethoven, start that rocket and finish that symphony already. <laughs> the Libra. <laughs> I've got to stop those cham sessions with Dizzy Van Gillespie. Oh, Ludwig. Ludwig. Yeah, Mama. I've got the message for you. Mo called. Mo who? Mozart. <laughs> Mama, have you been spiking the strudel again? Oh, Ludwig. 
speak. There's somebody here to see you. A Herr Bingle von Crossbein. Oh, well, send him in. <laughs> Good day. I'm a Herr von Crossbein. Who? A Herr von Crossbein. The Crossbein, I believe, but where the hell? <laughs> Say, tell me, is that your nose, or are you eating a sausage? Yeah. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, I'm a singer. A broken-down schnook like you is a singer? <laughs> Ach, to liverwurst, this has given me mine charlies. <laughs> I have, you know, I'm Bingo von Krausbein, the famous singer. For three years, I played at Schlapsy Fritzies. <laughs> And I've come all the way from Unter der Linde to see you. Jawohl, auch der Liebel und Dunder Blitzen, you Schweinhund, you. Lean back, Dummkopf, you're getting Limburger on the microphone. <laughs> Believe me, that's an improvement. <laughs> Look, Beethoven, I got a deal for you. What's you're that? a composer, I'm a singer. All right, I'm let's try a song together. Good, we good. Do that. We try you know, Crossbein, I dedicated this composition to that wonderful restaurant that used to be on Oberhauser Street. Oh, yeah, you mean that delicatessen place where they had those king-sized big seats? Yeah. Heine folks behind the bar, and he had a big red nose. Mold would make the Wiener schnitzel and the sauerkraut with the minis in the middle. What a wonderful place was Heine's and more. <laughs> They never would light out the lights Cause the place would never close And Schultz would play a squeeze box All of it off to leave us such a beautiful smoke You could blow your top in harnies and more Ach, we was the gay blades in those days, eh, my now? Yeah, I remember we belonged to the Wilhelmstrasse And pickled herring and necking society yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we got around to the pickled herring Yeah <laughs> You fracture me, Crossbein. Oh, you stinker, you. Stop that. <laughs> Has your nose always been like that, or did you have that ballpoint put on it there? Yeah. What is it? <laughs> the free lunch was gorgeous. The be of us always cold. On the dancing with the women. Ah, the women. Yeah, you vote. You could... Well, the place was 16 blocks, and it wasn't any ores. <laughs> Garlic cheese and old Limburg and pickles mixed with the herring together, and the meatball tasted just like leather. Chopped up liver and bologna, pickle takes feet out for bony and salon. Hey, Professor! <laughs> what is it? Now you heard me sing, how do you like my voice? Please, not while I'm eating. <laughs> Let's go where the place is jumping. Let's all go down to Heinz and all. Oh, no. I want to thank Bing Crosby for being with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we're making plans for next Tuesday's show, and we'd like your advice. Would you rather have me sing Buttons and Bows, or would you rather have Jane Russell? Well, thanks, Tuesday. I'm just kidding. That gal you'd like to see most in her Christmas stockings, my two-gun mate from the Pale Face will be here, Jane Russell. And, folks, there are only 15 more shopping days before Christmas, which is still plenty of time to remember the scientists who are looking for a cure for arthritis. If you want to help, write to Arthritis, Box 1200, General Post Office, New York, New York. Millions of people have arthritis. Millions of dollars are needed. So don't forget the address. Arthritis, Box 1200, General Post Office, New York, New York. Thanks and good night, everybody. It is when you use Rave Cream Shampoo. Rave leaves your hair so clean, so soft, so easy to manage. Easy to manage because the pure lanolin in Rave is specially blended with other important ingredients to make hair behave, even on shampoo day. Try Rave Cream Shampoo. R-A-Y-V-E. Rave Cream Shampoo. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.